Okay, looks like um, people are mostly done. Uh, <coughs> uh, can I can I collect them? Laptops and Mac laptops. 
uh, the software, the requisite use, in fact, uh, the software way over 200,000, so we speak 200,000 users all over the world. It's software that we develop here in, in the physical part of ours, but very popular, and so definitely uh, you should be able to use it to run it and it comes with a tutorial that is available on the website where you download uh, the software and you will be easy to do. Okay, good. So if you have any question for me about this, otherwise I'm looking forward to the first lecture. Do you want to introduce the TAs? Uh, oh yes, uh, that's a nice idea. So we have actually uh, uh, quite a few TAs for some fluctuation, but also we want to, to, to develop some new material at this time for the course. And so I think there are so many more. And for you, no, uh, let's go. Uh, let and then, yeah, so, and uh, so there are the two TAs, so they are listed already on the, on one of the sheets. And then uh, we have also a third uh, um, a TA, who I use always the name for scientists, for the one who makes sure that the problems have been out, and they take anything time, so they do everything in the back. His name is Ivan Theo, but uh, the poor guy is incredibly enjoying life in France. And then, uh, one month's meeting, uh, one month's uh, research stay there. He will be here back here in two weeks. So we have quite a few uh, um, TAs in which you can come and talk, uh, talk to us. I also have office hours. I also listed it on, on one of the sheets with uh, Philippos on the first part of the, of the lecture. So we're invited. We have to go to Beckman. Beckman is like the angle for me of two blocks. Uh, but uh, it's very nice there. And, uh, and, uh, and I would call it like to, to, to ask questions. Uh, uh, OK. Uh, great. That's it. There is no meter in the course? Uh, no meter, no. Just the uh, final and the final. The final is during the final week. And we leave it at the beginning of the week and the uh, week last of the week. So if you make plans to leave already in the middle of the final week home, then you have to do the final take on the equipment. So we will be leaving it uh, early, so like we uh, will leave it actually the day before the final week, but the final week is the final week. So, uh, okay, if you have a particular problem there, we might adjust a little bit by a day or something, um, but otherwise we just have to plan for it. Okay? Okay, so let's enjoy it. Okay, so uh, my, uh, I'm a technical <coughs> physics professor here, and uh, my research is in biophysics, experimental biophysics. Most people call me TJ, uh, as in Tom and Jerry, so you can call me TJ too. So today I'm going to just give you a, a brief overview of uh, you know, kind of research that I do and also some of the people uh, on campus are working on. Just you know, more as an introduction. So um, let me tell you about myself. I call myself an, an accident, accidental biophysicist. What is a biophysicist? Uh, who is a biophysicist? I would say he's a, he's a biologist or she is a biologist with a big laser. Uh, or big computer, uh, or a physicist with uh, physicist who studies uh, squishy materials. Oh, oh laser points already. Yeah. Okay, here. So, um, so all my degrees are in uh, in physics, and uh, I was born and raised in uh, South Korea, and uh, then went through training uh, in California before I came here. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I was appointed as an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which is, I would say, is a pretty uh, strong endorsement that what we are doing uh, is uh, relevant to biology and hopefully even medicine. So over the years, my uh, research has uh, moved from purely physics to now we, we study o only biological uh, problems using physical tools. And the topics that we are interested in are cancer related and also uh, uh, processes that are involved in infectious diseases. I often call myself a, a bat. Uh, 
because uh, it's like half animal, half bird. Uh, uh, so when I talk to physicists, I tell them I'm a biologist. And uh, when I talk to the biologists, I tell them I'm a physicist. And uh, this is very convenient because no one asks me uh, difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a physicist. OK, it's OK. Right? So, uh, Perhaps uh, the, the first physicist, real physicist, was Galileo Galilei. And uh, he once said that his purpose was to set forth a very new science uh, dealing with a very ancient subject. And there is in nature perhaps nothing older than motion. So he was fascinated with, uh, with motion, be it uh, planetary motion around the sun. You know, for physicists, it can be uh, electrons orbiting an atom, or uh, it can be molecules moving uh, inside the cell. So the fascination with motion is actually natural to all physicists. We just look at biological molecules. There are two types of motion in biology. Uh, one is uh, diffusion, uh, Brownian motion. It has no uh, uh, directionality, uh, really, and it's driven by uh, thermal fluctuations. Diffusion can be very rapid on short length scales. Uh, for example, for typical biomolecules such as a protein, it can diffuse over 10 nanometer length scale in one microsecond. But uh, it's very slow on the long length scale. You know, in, in your neurons, uh, nerves, you know, cells can be very long. And uh, then you can make uh, important molecules somewhere in the cell. And it's, these molecules have to, be, have to be transported down the neuron's body. And that uh, can take a long time if you rely on diffusion. Therefore, you need to have uh, directed motions. So that uh, uh, type of motion is driven by <coughs> molecular motors in the cell. And uh, you cannot get a directed motion without a free energy input. So uh, in, 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 in biology, uh, there are motors who consume uh, free energy, uh, most, mostly in the form of ATP hydrolysis, that's a breakdown of a cellular energy currency. Directed motion in biology is uh, relatively slow on a short length scale. For the same uh, 10 nanometer, it'll take uh, you know, 10 times, 10,000 times longer, 10 milliseconds to move that 10 nanometer for a typical motor protein, but uh, uh, is uh, much more rapid than diffusion on um, on a longer length scale. Okay. Maybe uh, we should turn off the light uh, in the back. And then turn on the light, the other one. OK, so that's better. Thank you. So this is a movie uh, made by uh, people at Harvard University to illustrate how a motor protein could move on a cellular track carrying a big cargo. And uh, this is all fantasy based on some data, uh, but most of it is actually just uh, imagination, but with some bearing to uh, true, uh, truth. So just like cars moving on the highway using gasoline as a fuel, this kinesin uh, molecule moves on a track called microtubule using ATP as uh, the fuel molecule. So molecular motors are proteins that move on the cellular highways uh, directionally. And the important function is to carry a cargo. Okay? I told you about uh, the nerves, uh, why it's useful to be able to carry the cargo along a long uh, neuron. Here's another example. Uh, many animals are no known to change their color uh, upon you know, signaling or stimulus. You know, chameleons can do that. Even uh, fish can do that. Uh, so the fish can change the uh, color of the skin cell from dark to white or back and forth using the motor proteins. How? Well, here's a single cell of uh, a fish uh, skin cell. Uh, I got this movie from a friend uh, in Northwestern University, uh, Vladimir Gelfand. Uh, in the skin cell, uh, there are many uh, dark pigments. There are these uh, dark uh, objects 
you know, spherical objects that are, are evenly spread over, or in, within the cell. So under this condition, cell appears dark because you know, dark pig pigments are everywhere. But then when uh, the cell wants to become uh, clear, uh, transparent or white, then what, the, what, what it does is to use a motor proteins to move all of the cargo, uh, so these dark pigments, toward the middle of the cell. And that, of course, of course requires that you have the tracks that are uh, positioned radially, radiating from the center. Once that happens, you can clear up most of the cell area, and the cell can change the, the appearance. So let me show you the, the movie here. It's just repeating. Isn't this amazing? So this is how chameleons change color. They use motor proteins, and uh, they don't make new things. They just move things around to redistribute them. And then there are, there are other ways to also move them out, right? depending on what you want to do. Okay. So that's another uh, uh, reason why, why motor proteins, proteins can be very useful. Any, any question? Yes? What's the time scale on this? I think it's real time. Uh, I'm not 100% sure it's, I think it's real time. Actually, uh, maybe not. You know, actually, let me see. So typically, motor protein can move the cargo one microns per second. So that is probably uh, you know, faster than that, because uh, typically, this, this kind of cells can be you know, 30 microns across. And this doesn't seem, you know, it looks like it's taking more than, you know, less than, like, 30 seconds and so on, right? So to make the cell dark again, is there a motor driven mechanism? Yes, yes. So, uh, so there are motor proteins that move, uh, if there's a track, like I said, there's a track radiating from the center, there are motor proteins that move uh, in this direction, and there are others uh, that move in the opposite direction, OK? So, and it's called the regulation of the protein function, basically. You know, you have proteins that are known to function in a certain way, but what's equally more important, important is the, the fact that their functions need to be regulated. You need to turn on and turn off their functions on demand. That's where you do it. Basically, you use one type of motor to move them in, and then you, you stop them, and then if you want to move them out, you use the other kind of motor to, to move them out. Okay. Yes? So just these two modes, able to get all these different colors over the seas? Okay, okay, so then uh, it becomes more complicated, but same principle, right? It's all engineering, yeah, this is physics? <laughs> if you have the multiple colors, it's engineering, okay. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other question? So uh, how small is a protein? Uh, I asked this question, uh, how, how is it uh, uh, proteins typically uh, 100 nanometers in diameter? Actually, the answer is no. Uh, uh, they are much smaller. So just to make a comparison, so this is a uh, human, uh, actually like me, OK? And, and, then, uh, and then if you look inside the body, there you have a cell. And then if you inside the cell, uh, you have a motor, uh, or actually protein uh, carrying a cargo. So this can be the Earth. You know, and then uh, if the human body is the size of the Earth, then the cell can be the size of a small city. This is actually a city in Colorado, a ski resort, uh, where I gave my talk using this slide. And then here's a, a, a protein that is moving down the ski slope. I don't know, do I have, uh, OK. I even have a, this is a, uh, Bo, uh, Bo, uh, Bo Miller, my favorite. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so that you can actually see the, the relative uh, scales. Okay? So really, you are really talking about things that are very, very small. Uh, for this particular one, uh, there was actually a, a controversy about how it uh, moves on the track. Uh, this way, uh, you know, it looks like somebody is walking on the street, a uh, bipedal walker. Uh, and this mechanism is called the hand over hand, which is strange because they, to me, they look like feet instead of hands. 
and but then if these little things that I they, they look like the feet I actually call it heads in the community so the heads hands and uh, feet all very confusing so 10 years ago I asked my daughter to help me out and uh, so she uh, uh, sh uh, my daughter then uh, demonstrate uh, the hand over hand mechanism. Uh, uh, so that's why it's this this is called hand over hand mechanism. And and there is a jargon in the community called uh, is processive means that once the motor starts to walk, uh, it takes more than one step before dissociating from the track. And uh, according to this jargon, she is highly processive because her track is limited only by the length of the track. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> okay, that's the idea. All right, so um, in one way to look at uh, the motor proteins uh, is to use fluorescence. And this is, uh, I, I, I'm going to spend a couple of weeks of lecture plus uh, uh, two laboratory modules to uh, cover this uh, in the second part of the uh, class. So I use photons, of course. Um, and uh, there's an organic uh, molecule uh, with uh, aromatic wings. And when you uh, shine laser light to the molecule, then uh, it actually gives out a photon of different color. That's a uh, fluorescence photon. And because of the you know, particle in a box type of uh, you know, quantum physics, when you have a molecule that is slightly longer, then uh, color relevant also is actually uh, uh, more red shifted. Okay? low energy between uh, the energy levels. So we use fluorescence to uh, visualize these molecules. What you do is you attach the fluorescent molecule to uh, an unknown position on the, on the motor protein. And then, uh, then you can image this inside a dark room. So you can uh, image even single uh, motor proteins precisely. And uh, first thing we did was to use uh, myosin-5 uh, this is another motor protein moving on a different track <coughs> called actin filament. What's amazing about this one is that among the motor prote proteins that are known in nature, uh, it takes the largest step. Okay? The step size of this motor protein is uh, 37 nanometers, largest known. Uh, and again, there's, there's the same controversy about the hand over hand uh, and, and mechanism. So we, you can imagine putting a uh, dye there and then image it inside a microscope. And if you use a uh, camera to image a single uh, dye molecule, uh, uh, you, then uh, you get a uh, pixelated image. Uh, instead of uh, all the photons coming to a single pixel, uh, you see uh, photons uh, spread over several pixels across about 250 nanometers. That's because uh, uh, of the diffraction limit. Uh, I think you have, in the physics course, you have taken, uh, you, you, know, ha you saw an example of single slit diffraction. So this is exactly that. Or you can also use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to, to derive this. But even when you have a point object, uh, imaging using a visible light will give you uh, an image that is actually quite spread over uh, uh, a large distance. Uh, this means that normally you cannot uh, distinguish two objects as two separate objects if they are closer than that distance. But if you actually use some math to, uh, to fit the Gaussian distribution you know, to you know, two-dimensional Gaussian, then you can find the center quite precisely down to uh, you know, one or two nanometers. So that's uh, what we used here to uh, find uh, the position of the motor as a function of time. So here's an example uh, done uh, 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 my colleague Paul Selvin's group, uh, uh, his former student Ahmed Yildiz. So you can follow uh, the motor protein uh, by taking a movie as a function of time. You can see that that spot is actually taking these three steps. It's, there, was, there was a step, and then there was another step, and so on. And at each frame of the movie, you find the center and plot the center position as a function of time. You can see beautiful steps. And if you measure the step size, it turns out to be the twice the step size of the center of mass. The 74 nanometers, that actually uh, turns out to be really uh, you know, conclusive proof that uh, the hand over hand mechanism is the correct one. Until that point, there was a, a controversy. So, this one, uh, I mentioned that uh, Ahmed Yildiz uh, uh, did the work. He is now uh, 
a professor of physics and biology at UC Berkeley. Uh, he's been there for, he's, he's doing an excellent job there also. This is Paul Sevin, that's myself. And, uh, and this picture shows that if a student does a good job, we take the student to Hawaii. <laughs> okay, so coming back to uh, the ski metaphor, you have uh, a picture of a buttermilk ski uh, resort in uh, Aspen, Colorado. And what I showed you in terms of the motor protein moving and if tracking its motion is like attaching a, a, a light bulb of fluorescent molecule to a skier and then uh, follow um, that uh, light in the dark. Right, so that's, that's what you do. But uh, this, this type of measurement does not really tell you why uh, she's actually uh, another famous skier. Uh, anyone knows who knows this, her name? Lindsay Vaughn. Okay. So she's uh, another famous US skier. So, but uh, the measurement that I showed you earlier can tell you that she's really fast, but it doesn't tell you why she's fast, how she's such a good, uh, good skier. It, it's, it turns out that uh, there is another jargon in biology, uh, in biophysics, it's called conformations, basically different shapes, you know. And the ski will have to undergo changes between different conformations, different poses, right, to, to function. So if you just follow one uh, light uh, source as a function of time, you don't really see what's going on. So one uh, thing that you can do is to, uh, uh, to do something better, because this doesn't really tell you anything. So, so we use uh, another method called a fret. And the idea is that instead of having one uh, light source, we use two. Uh, uh, different colors, green and red, and then when you excite the, the green dye, then you get a green signal. Uh, but when you bring the red dye uh, uh, close to the green dye, then uh, they talk to each other, and there is a dipole dipole interaction between the two. Uh, energy can be directly transferred to the red dye, and you get a red photon. But that tells you you know, the relative distance change between the two molecules. And this uh, is a very strong function of distance uh, in the nanometer length scale. And so that if your molecule uh, uh, goes back and forth between the closed and open conformations, uh, uh, pauses, pauses, then uh, you can distinguish between the two by saying that, oh, here you get red signal strong, and here you get green signal strong. So that is another method that, uh, that we use, and you'll be actually doing an example uh, in the lab. So <laughs> here's another way to illustrate this concept. Uh, Gangnam style in simple four steps. Okay, um, and so in fact, um, uh, I made a movie uh, my, my, of myself dancing with glow sticks to demonstrate this concept. If you have to Google Gangnam Style, you will not enjoy this slide. <laughs> so here. <laughs> so this was Aspen Opera House, where I gave this lecture. Actually, that, that was not me. That was my son, who I took uh, to the place. I'm, I'm, I'm actually speaking right there. Anyway, so that's uh, the concept of FRET. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, when you image a single molecule, the two uh, dyes are actually very close to each other. So you cannot really see them as separate lights, as you see on the stage with two glow sticks. So what you actually do is that you simply look at the overall color. And based on the color, you deduce what's going on. So when the uh, two are intermediate distance, you see uh, you know, both green and red, so you get yellow color. And then, uh, and when they are far away from each other, you get green, because there is little energy transfer. And here you get uh, a strong energy transfer when they're close to each other, and then you get red signal, and you know, going back and forth, okay? And then uh, final reaction. Anyway, so then you can measure the intensities of green and red as a function of time, and, uh, and that really tells you what's going on. Okay, so this is like one uh, powerful tool that we use. Just to just make the point very clear, I am showing you another movie. Uh, I have a friend in uh, Korea who is in the movie industry. 
what he does actually is to make TV commercials mainly. Uh, so I told him about our technique, and then he made this movie for me. And uh, so you have a cell membrane, there are two proteins uh, moving around, uh, and when the two are close to each other, this occurs, energy transfer occurs, uh, you get many red signal and, uh, and vice versa. He even made a cool soundtrack here. Yeah. So, um, you know, what uh, we can do is, you know, for example, to look at uh, another mode of protein moving on, in this case, DNA. Protein is moving on the DNA, and then as uh, the protein uh, approaches the end of the DNA tract, when green and red molecules come close to each other, you see a <coughs> gradual uh, decrease in green and gradual increase in red due to an increase in uh, energy uh, transfer. So that is kind of signal you can imagine getting. Do we get a signal that is as beautiful as uh, my PowerPoint animation? No, but uh, it's close. So here is an actual real data uh, uh, where you can see that uh, green is going down and red is uh, going up. And, uh, and that actually uh, you can see many, many times. The surprise there was that instead of coming to the end and then just falling off, it actually goes back to the beginning and repeats this many, many times, just like in my PowerPoint animation. Okay? So that was a surprise. And we did a lot of experiments to understand what's going on and also to, to understand uh, what it means biologically and functionally and so on. So we, in the end, we uh, you know, wrote a paper uh, reporting uh, our observations why we think it's important. So we asked one of the uh, trade magazines uh, in the community to, to run our story. And, uh, and after the user back and forth, they eventually agreed to do that. Uh, so then, that, then actually, I did something that I have never done before, actually. Uh, uh, I, I uh, asked a local uh, design company to uh, make a, a cover illustration to, uh, to suggest to the magazine that maybe you should uh, run a story with a cover story. Um, so here the idea is that you have this uh, protein uh, uh, moving on the DNA, in fact, sitting on the DNA and then reeling in the DNA strand and then uh, and, uh, kicking out the proteins bound to the DNA. So that was our suggestion. I thought this was pretty good. We spent a lot of money, and, uh, but they didn't take it. Um, uh, instead, they chose a uh, 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 diabetic mouse. And uh, so it's, it was very disappointing, but you know, in, in life, uh, you win some and lose some, so it's okay. okay? Let me show you another failed uh, suggestion. Um, so we, uh, this was part of our submission, uh, too. Uh, uh, now the, my student who did the work was a superhero, and then she was, uh, again, uh, kicking up the asteroid from the, the DNA. And it still didn't work. Okay, so at least I can show this uh, in my lectures. All right. Um, so another uh, fluorescence method that, uh, that, is, that is very, very popular and powerful is, uh, is called a super resolution imaging. So just to uh, in introduce this concept, if you go to uh, Jena in Germany, uh, this, was, this is a city uh, that uh, had uh, Carl Zeiss microscopy company uh, since uh, about 200 years ago. And, and the famous uh, scientist Abe, Abe uh, uh, wrote down this equation saying that the smallest distance you can resolve using optical microscopy is, is this, uh, wavelength divided by you know, about the factor of two. And, and so this is the Abe's diffraction limit. And it's set in stone, okay? So this, it became all the more impressive when people began to show that you can actually do better than this. In fact, much better. So here uh, comes this power factor of 10. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, actually, you guys probably don't know what a CD is. You're too young to, uh, <laughs> to rem remember what, what a CD is. Is that right? Or have you bought a CD in your life? OK, all right, all right. OK, you don't, you don't download everything, OK. So, uh, so when DVD, before DVD came along, uh, there were some intermediate technologies that were maybe twice or three times better in terms of storage capacity and so on than DVD, uh, CD, but that they never took on, uh, took off because you know, people were not willing to pay big money for things that are just two or three times better. Okay? It was not until DVD came along when things are 10 times better that people actually switched. Okay? I think the same is true for microscopy. Uh, there were 
technologies that are slightly better than, you know, you know, 250 nanometer resolution. But when uh, uh, technologies called Palm and Stone came along uh, eight, uh, seven years ago, when things are 10 times better, finally, then really uh, things st took off. And this is based on uh, single molecule uh, imaging technologies. Just to illustrate how powerful this is, so this is a fluorescence image of a cell, but you are staining um, microtubules. Microtubules are cellular highways for kinase motor proteins, motor proteins to work, uh, work on. So at the conventional microscopy resolution, that's what you see. You see uh, you know, filament-like structures, long filaments, but some appear uh, brighter than others because they are made of multiple filaments uh, very close to each other. Now, if you do super resolution imaging, which you will do uh, in the second part of the lecture in the lab, uh, second part of the course in the, in the lab, uh, you can get things uh, that are much better uh, resolved. You can see things uh, much better. Okay, so that is the power of super resolution imaging. And, and the idea uh, is, is the following. So if you have uh, a ring of nine different molecules uh, forming a ring, but if you image nine molecules shown here using a conventional microscopy, you just see a one spot because they are too close to each other to be able to be distinguished. So what you do is that you turn off everything. You somehow tell the molecules, okay, uh, why don't you uh, uh, shut up? And then they, they, okay, they, uh, they uh, shut off. And then you uh, tell, okay, why don't one of you just uh, light up? And then you can take an image. <coughs> and as I told you, if you have a single molecule, you can find the center of the molecule very precisely <coughs> down to a couple of nanometers. And uh, so you find the center and mark it on your uh, final image. And you do this uh, many, many times. You do it another time, mark the position, and then you do it many, many times. And eventually, uh, you can build an image. Now it shows a ring instead of a, a single blob. So this is uh, the first image uh, reported uh, based on this technology. So they, uh, they have some proteins on DNA, uh, circular DNA. And up here, you have a conventional image of presumably a ring structure. But now, if you do the super resolution, uh, single molecule based localization, then you see uh, the actual ring. Okay? So that is uh, the power of this approach. And you can also, uh, and, and that's how you actually obtain uh, uh, an image uh, shown here. All right, uh, question? Yes? The blurred image on the left, that is regular every person. Yes. And I mean, and apart from image processing, there's no other way that you can find a single molecule. I mean, you can find actually where the molecule is. If you start from this image, no. So, I mean, from the blurred image to the nice one, ah. it's mostly just image processing and looking at each molecule one by one. That's right. So the blurred. Uh, Basically, you, you activate only one molecule at a time. You find the center. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you activate only one molecule? So it's, uh, you just activate, uh, you use a different laser light to, uh, you know, first you use one color laser to turn everything off, to go send them to a dark state. And then you use a different color laser to uh, activate some of them. Okay. But if you use, uh, a low enough in intensity for a short enough time, then you know you you have just very few showing up. Okay, so it, it, you, it, the process is stochastic. You cannot tell this molecule to, to come up. I I have to say, okay, you know, some of you come up, right? Then that's how it works. So it's st stochastic activation. What is the time scale of the Okay, so you can uh, do it actually as fast as 100, about 100 times a second. But typically, maybe 10 times a second. Yeah. So you can do uh, in two colors nowadays, uh, even three or four colors. So here's an example of uh, a two-color imaging of uh, 
microtubule in green, and then uh, red uh, imaging of another cellular structure. Maybe it's time to t turn off the light. All right, so uh, this is a zoom in image. You can see one micron length scale. And the red uh, actually uh, is, uh, is staining a protein uh, that is known to be a part of a spherical cellular structure. Uh, it should form a spherical shell. And that's about maybe 150 nanometers. And you can see things quite uh, clearly in uh, high resolution. And, and so on. Actually, you can see that uh, it almost looks like an empty uh, shell, but you know, it is uh, not totally clear. So you can actually do this uh, also in uh, 3D and using uh, uh, a different uh, sl slightly modification, uh, slight modification of the technique using a cylindrical lens. And then you can actually uh, uh, show that it is really a hollow uh, sphere by, by taking images in, in 3D. So it's now quite routine to do two color like 3D imaging at 20 or 30 nanometer resolution. That is about 10 times better than the diffraction limit resolution. So really changing uh, uh, the way, uh, uh, you know, the life science is being done in many different uh, fields and it'll become uh, even uh, uh, more exciting uh, as the tool becomes more available to, to biologists. So here's an example where um, they uh, imaged uh, mitochondria, uh, cellular power plant, and uh, there are ma many, many mitochondria that, that look like um, uh, uh, Cheetos, Cheetos, uh, no, yes, Cheetos. The, there's a, the type of Cheetos that is Puffy, you know, Cheetos, right? So this, these, are, these are cellular organisms that look like puff, puffy uh, Cheetos. And so here they are showing uh, different uh, heights of the cell. So that's you know, another new thing that is uh, going on. So uh, I, I want to also uh, tell you about, yes? So you are not just using the electron microscope. What's the advantage of this technique? Okay, that is a very good question. So electron microscopy uh, can be used, uh, take images of cells and you know, tissues and so on uh, at, at a resolution down to about um, maybe. I don't know. Nanometers? Much better than tens of nanometers. Uh, it depends on you know what method you use, but if you don't average or many, uh, I think you can still do maybe a, you know you know five nanometers. So you can actually do better than uh, this uh, with, by using electrons. Uh, but electrons uh, have also issues. Uh, they uh, uh, they uh, they they cannot usually tell what proteins you are looking at. Right. Usually, you don't just want to look at some unidentified structures in the cell. You want to see which proteins are where, right? While uh, in, uh, it's much more difficult to do so in, uh, in electron microscopy. And there are, there are many other reasons. Electron microscopy can tend to damage the cells much more than a light microscopy. And it's much easier to do multicolor imaging in, in light microscopy because you can, uh, uh, you can uh, label different proteins with, in different colors. And it's, you can do that to a certain degree uh, in electron microscopy, but you know, not easily. Yeah. Yes? So what kind of computational strong? Well, it typically uh, is uh, quite slow. Uh, so you know, if you want to get really good looking images that, that I showed you, it will take probably 20 minutes. 
Okay? So this means that uh, it's hard to do this in uh, living cells <coughs> because uh, in living cells everything moves okay? and more than the resolution of your microscope. Right? So that's one, uh, uh, one limitation. All right, so uh, let me also uh, tell you a little bit about some, some other things that I, you know, I have in mind. Uh, uh, so, so we're using light, uh, photons, optical technologies to study problems in biology. And uh, really the goal in, in developing the technologies to make uh, what, uh, what's invisible today you know, visible tomorrow, okay? It sounds like a, uh, like a TV commercial. Uh, so here I want to just to give you a like, brief overview of you know, what's going on uh, uh, in science these days. And so uh, I have three uh, small segments, optogenetics, optomechanics, and um, deep imaging. Uh, so optogenetics uh, is, um, in, uh, technology to use light to excite neurons. Basically, uh, you know, there's nerves and you know, they are responsible for your thinking and uh, processing signals and uh, for your motion. You know, when you dance, you, you use neurons and so on. And uh, so this method to use light to excite neurons uh, is revolutionizing the brain, brain science in general. And uh, President Obama actually just announced a few months ago a new initiative to uh, fund uh, research to map brain activities in, of the entire human brain and to the tune of, I think, $300 million per year. So this optogenetics uh, has a nice beginning. Uh, scientists at Stanford University, uh, they develop technology <coughs> so that they can then use uh, a light uh, that is shining on the brain of a mouse. In fact, they, they make a hole and then uh, it's kind of cool, but it's also cruel, uh, depending on your perspective. Hopefully, it'll lead to uh, uh, something useful for uh, human conditions. Anyway, so, that, so uh, that's, that was the beginning, and really explode, exploded in terms of its uh, success and scope and um, scientific discoveries enabled by the technology. I think the most recent uh, uh, coverage uh, in, uh, in the news media was this one. Uh, the science paper about two months ago by a group in MIT. Tony Gawa was a Nobel Prize winner in immunology, but he, uh, his group showed that you can use optogenetics to incept uh, false memories into mice. Uh, so mice thinks that actually he has been to a room you know, with some food that in fact he has never been to. Okay? So it has interesting ethical implications. Uh, so, have you watched this movie? Yeah. Another uh, way to, uh, another uh, dimension of optogenetics is to use light to control uh, gene expression. So, what is gene expression? Gene is a DNA piece that codes for proteins. The expression of gene means that you actually use uh, DNA uh, encoding information to make proteins that are important for cellular functions. So, uh, so basically, you want to use light to control when and where certain proteins are made, are produced. And this can be useful for all of biology, not just neuroscience. And another interesting uh, example was published two years ago, where they used uh, light to control the secretion of insulin. You know, of course, insulin is important to maintain your glucose level in the, uh, in the blood. And uh, so, on a, in a diabetic mouse, that I don't really like, uh, for the reason I mentioned to you earlier, that uh, they could actually use uh, uh, light to control the insulin secretion to keep the glucose level uh, constant at a healthy level. So that's another really interesting example to use uh, the light in, in a biological setting. Question? Neil, you have a question? So there are some gaps uh, in terms of technology. So at best, most of these studies uh, were done using uh, diffraction limited resolution. Uh, although you know, many of the important cellular structures 
have a much smaller dimension. And when you have a thick sample, such as the brain uh, or lung, uh, uh, then uh, scattering of the light from the tissue and also background fluorescence can really c kill your signal. Uh, so you can no longer study them. And multiplexing is still making meaning that uh, it's, it, you can do uh, act, you know, excite a neuron with one, one color, but if you want to excite two different kinds of neurons with two different colors, it's still not very easy to do. And uh, for the toxicity, it is a problem. You use light to image what's going on, but then the light itself can uh, uh, be toxic to the cells and animals and so on. And that is also a major problem that needs to be uh, overcome. So here's uh, one e example. You know, you have super resolution fluorescence emission technology. And this is, uh, I think, by far the most uh, impressive uh, demonstration of the power of the method. Can you turn up the light? Sorry, yeah. So this is a group uh, of Xiaowei Zhuang at Harvard University. The paper came out uh, just this year. So imaging uh, neurons, uh, and then they found that actin molecules um, that are the actually uh, forming the track for myosin 5 and other motor proteins actually form uh, a periodic uh, ring structures along, uh, along the neuron. Uh, that are spaced by uh, a gap of 180 nanometers, which is actually smaller than the diffusion limited resolution. So, uh, and, and without the extra resolution, without the light microscopy that can stain specific molecules uh, instead of electron microscopy that s sees everything, you would not be able to discover uh, uh, such a structure. So that's a really impressive uh, development. You can also use uh, Nowadays, a uh, label-free microscopy uh, with vibrational contrast, meaning that instead of labeling the proteins you want to study using fluorescent molecules, for example, you can uh, just uh, use a difference in uh, vibrational levels of different biomolecules to image uh, cells and tissues without, uh, without losing uh, <coughs> I mean, you know, the ability to track them. So here is actually a uh, uh, Raman uh, s spectrum of DNA, protein, and lipids in the cell. They have distinct signatures. So by using uh, Raman scattering of a special type, uh, uh, you can actually uh, see the DNA in red and uh, lipids in, uh, in uh, blue in a single cell uh, without actually introducing any external uh, labels. So this is label-free imaging of a cell. And you can actually follow the cell through the division of the cell. So I think if this movie works, then you can also see that. You can see that uh, the red, which is DNA, kind of comes to the middle of the cell, uh, where cell division occurs. And then, then it splits into two upon cell division. Okay? So that's actually something you can actually do nowadays uh, using advanced uh, light-based microscopy. Also, when you look at uh, thick samples such as uh, tissues and so on, you get uh, aberrations. And this is a problem that was encountered by astronomy uh, for a long time. And so, basically, fluctuations of the air in the atmosphere can perturb the light pass from, the, uh, from a star that you want to image to, you, to the MIT telescope. You can actually uh, solve this uh, to a large degree by using an adaptive optics, which basically uses uh, a guide star that shouldn't change anything, and then to correct for uh, atmospheric air fluctuations to, uh, to regain the uh, diffraction limited resolution. So nowadays, people use adaptive optics to uh, improve uh, uh, imaging, uh, in this case, uh, in living mouse brain. So without uh, adaptive optics, with uh, adaptive optics, you can see uh, you know, significant improvement in resolution, both in X, Y, and, and, and Z. So uh, this will become uh, actually more and more important as our abilities to prepare an image, uh, you know, thick samples uh, improve. And this is actually really a, a uh, really a, a famous example uh, in that direction. 
so uh, just a few months ago, you may have seen this. Uh, scientists in Stanford University, they announced that they uh, developed techni a technique called Clarity. And Clarity is actually an acronym for something, I forgot what it is, but it's actually clear enough that people just use Clarity without thinking what the acronym is for. So uh, what the idea is that if you uh, have a mouse brain, this is a brain <coughs> of, a, of a mouse, and uh, you can see that it's not transparent, okay? Uh, the reason is that uh, there's, uh, there's so, uh, so much fat uh, in, in the brain. Uh, fat scatters light. That's why it, it, it looks opaque. So what they did was to find a way to you know, fix all of the other structures in the cell, you know, DNA, protein, and, and so on, into the existing 3D structure. And then they found a way to remove uh, fat, you know, lipid molecules, from the brain. And after they have done this, then uh, the organ become uh, transparent. So this is the title of a New York Times story about this paper, Brain as Clear as a Jello. And actually, there is a brain here, but you can read through it. This is mouse brain that uh, you can actually see it through. Okay? So quite, uh, uh, quite amazing. Here's a, this movie shows um, a half millimeter section of a human patient uh, who died at the age of seven. Uh, and he, he was a, an autistic student, that autistic uh, boy. And they, they actually made this section, and then they were able to follow a single neuron uh, across the entire slice, because now the thing is transparent. You can actually do that. Okay. Questions? Yes, yeah, so they are, they are imaging the neurons. Actually, I, I don't know what probe they're using, but it's, it's a probe specific to the neurons. So you can, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's actually ex exon. But. So do you first make it clear and then um, introduce your probes into the Yeah, that's right. You mo first make it clear, uh, and then you, then you label different things you're interested in studying. So I know that uh, this guy is now a professor in MIT. And uh, his goal is to improve the technology further to study the human brain without slicing. Uh, I think the difficulty is that uh, human brain, brain has three times more fat than uh, the mouse brain. So that is, uh, you have to remove more of the materials. So we'll see how far he can go. All right, so uh, there is for optogenetics. And optomechanics is uh, basically use uh, light to do mechanical perturbations and mechanical measurements in molecules and cells and so on. So the, the most actually uh, popular technique is called optical trap or optical tweezers. You basically use a focused laser light to uh, trap a small uh, particle. And then you can uh, manipulate the particle. And if you have a DNA molecule connecting the two particles held in two traps back to back, then you can manipulate the DNA and you measure the mechanical properties of the DNA and so on. Now, based on the, the technologies uh, developed by Stephen Block and, and others, you can do this at uh, angstrom level of resolution. Uh, so we call it ultra high resolution optical trap. And so in this department, Jan Shemna is, is the world-class expert on this method. Uh, his name is here. So, so one example uh, that I can show you here is, is a virus. Uh, a virus is, is a, a life form that infects a cells and then uh, it, and amplify its, amplifies itself. So here, uh, this virus, uh, encodes this genomic information in the form of DNA, but DNA has to be uh, uh, packaged into the small volume of the virus particle. And that is done by uh, a motor protein sitting at the entrance of the virus uh, particle. And it uses ATP uh, to uh, pull the DNA into the particle. So you can actually use optical trap to measure the process in real time. And the first surprise that they found is that the DNA lengths between the two uh, 
two beats, a uh, change in the steps of 10 base pairs. So that was uh, a surprise. The second surprise was that when they uh, use uh, you know, increased forces to slow down the reaction to be able to see individual steps, uh, then, uh, then they found that each 10 base pair step is made of uh, four 2.5 base, base pair steps. So that is actually uh, a big surprise because until this point, no one has seen non-integer uh, base pair, number of step, base pair stepping behavior of any uh, molecules in, in biology. <coughs> so that uh, really illustrates the power of uh, you know, achieving the ultimate resolution of single base pairs and so on. Okay? So that is, I think I would say, the hallmark of physics, the precision measurements. Data are precise enough uh, so that you can actually distinguish between different models or make a statement that you know, would not have been, been possible uh, before you have the precision. Here's another example, uh, uh, optical trap, but it's called the angular optical trap because now you can use uh, light to uh, twist the DNA by starting with uh, an object that uh, has uh, asymmetry. So this uh, was developed by a lab in Cornell University by Michel Wang. And uh, so you can actually uh, rotate uh, this particle using a polarized light and uh, thereby uh, causing the twisting of the DNA. Okay? So you have a full control of the torque uh, and the rotation of the DNA. And, uh, uh, and they, uh, they just reported this year also um, really quite impressive uh, 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 discovery on how uh, the protein um, working on the DNA can uh, change its behavior based on the torsion on the DNA. Again, uh, uh, technological feed allowing new uh, discovery. So there are some uh, uh, and another uh, example that I want to uh, tell you about, this is also local here. Uh, the group of Jan Shemna, uh, together with Ido Golding, uh, here uh, uh, developed an instrument called a bacterial treadmill. So this is uh, a single E. coli bacterium. And it swims uh, using its tail, uh, called flagellum, uh, basically trying to find a better condition for its life. And what they can do is they can use uh, focused laser beams, two optical traps, to hold the uh, bacterium. And it continues to swim, but getting nowhere. And you can follow the swimming behavior for, for a long time, up to an hour. And that uh, is called uh, the treadmill because you know, it's like a treadmill. You, you run as fast as you can, but you, you go nowhere, uh, as, same as here. This uh, method was then used to uh, see, uh, study a process called adaptation. Okay? What is an adaptation? Well, uh, your girlfriend uh, dumps you, right? Uh, then your happiness level drops. Right? But, but now you know, based on experience, your experience, that you will recover after two weeks, right? whatever, whatever the time constant is. You will recover the exact same ha level of happiness as before. That's called adaptation. Okay, it's not really the the absolute uh, amount of whatever is good for you that you have that determines your happiness. It's the ch time temporal change gradient that determines your happiness. And so what uh, what they did was uh, to uh, to uh, follow a single bacterium swimming, and then bacteria can uh, you know swim in a straight path called run and our tumble to change the direction. And this happens with a certain frequency. But then when, when you give the bacterium using microfluidics uh, the food that it likes, some sugar that it likes, then uh, it's very happy suddenly. So then it stops to tumble. So actually it just continues to run the same direction because it's very, very happy, okay? So, uh, uh, so you, you hear good news and then you, you stay, stay high, happy for some time. But then, you know, you know that you will, it'll die out. You recover the same degree of happiness as before. But the surprise here was that the bacterium does not actually recover the original happiness gradually. It actually, you know, recovers abruptly. Okay, it's as if that, you know, maybe uh, I I win a prize. Okay, 
and then uh, I'm happy for two weeks, and then when the midnight hits, then I, I recover the original happiness. And that's very strange, and, uh, there are, and that really rules out many possible models and how this process uh, uh, functions. So again, this type of data really allow you to develop uh, models uh, 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 that can be actually uh, much more revealing than, uh, than the models uh, uh, developed without this type of data. So what is that signal, the light that you're actually is that what the signal is? Yeah, so what, what, what you do is that you uh, shine light and then laser light is somehow scattered from the uh, bacterium. So you detect it using uh, a detector. And then uh, when it swims, it rotates. So you see this oscillatory behavior. When it uh, swims swim in a certain direction, it could run. But then uh, you can kind of see it here. When it tumbles, now that signal becomes kind of sc scrambled. And that's how you say, OK, it's swimming, running, and then tumbling, and so on. Okay. So this is actually a very important process for uh, the evolution of uh, the life, because I mean, just to make the same analogy, right? So if you, if you stay always high, right, then you're not careful enough, and you'll be eaten by your predators. But so you know. But on the other hand, if you stay always depressed, based on one bad news, then you know you will kill yourself, or you'll not have enough energy to make offsprings, and so on. So this kind of adaptation is important for the survival of any uh, any species, and you can use a small uh, cell to 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 study that at at the most fundamental level in a very controlled way, which is, you know, to me, physics. All right, so, um, uh, but here there are also some uh, gaps. Uh, you know, when you measure this type of motion using uh, mechanical tools, you're not really uh, measuring anything about other properties of the molecule. I told you about the conformations, the shape change, of, and, and so on. And, uh, and also, the measurements tend to be very slow and low throughput. So um, one thing that uh, I can tell you uh, uh, is that in my lab, we actually develop uh, a method to combine fluorescence and force uh, so that you can uh, apply force to change the mechanical properties and then use fluorescence to measure the uh, structural changes. And that uh, has uh, turned out to be very powerful. And we are learning a lot of new things about about that. And uh, I think I'm going to show you one uh, <coughs> last slide here. And here is a collaboration between my lab and Jan Schemner's lab, uh, where a joint postdoc, Matt Comstock, who is now a, a professor of physics in Michigan State University, uh, he developed ultra high resolution optical trap with single molecule fluorescence so that you can measure fluorescence and uh, uh, single base pair movements of biomolecule. Uh, uh, simultaneously, and this is a fairly sophisticated uh, instrument. And for for technical reasons, you have to uh, uh, time share the laser beams. You can you have to actually turn off the trapping lasers when you excite the fluorescent molecule to avoid a rapid photo bleaching. But in the end, it works, and then it's producing uh, some really exciting data that you know. I hope you know maybe uh, you you'll have a chance to see in print at some point. All right, so uh, I'll stop here. Can you turn, turn uh, the light? And, uh, uh, and I'll say goodbye until, I guess, middle of October. And then uh, Professor Shilton will take over from uh, tomorrow. Uh, sorry, on